I'm curious to hear about how you guys went from that spark of interest in these women um, into actually doing the work of making these books. Like, what was your process like in terms, mostly of research? I mean, Gavin, you had almost nothing, pretty much nothing, and you had a lot more to research, but you must have had to sift through it in a really calculated way. So, if you guys could talk to me, Gavin, first about <coughs> what it looked like for you and. Well, in a sense, I didn't have nothing. I had a lot, yeah. just nothing of me. <laughs> and so the way I like to describe it is that there was this kind of eclipse of this shining light, and then there was a darkness in the center mm -hmm. where I had to put in. Um, my research was wide and various history, cultural, cultural history, theory, and all of that I was very comfortable with. It was all kind of very high level, distant, we got you know, reading Marx, reading okay. responses to Marx, so we think that's all academic, all very easy for me. The most work I had to do, the most research I had to do was the domestic space. Mm -hmm. Was what once I had all the ideas that were there that were flying around all the contradictions and all the ironies, what I didn't know was where could this take place. So most of my work was the 19th century house, the 19th century mm -hmm. the domestic space which was for me like setting the limits on what was possible for my character. So what would my character have done in this room at this time if this happened? So did you like How? visit spaces and? Well, no, visit spaces <laughs> in my mind. I mean, you know, time travel. <laughs> I researched the Victorian house, how the Victorian house worked, the utensils that we used, how did someone go to the twit, how did someone go and make a cup of tea. How did someone make a cup of tea? <laughs> um, and that was really important for what would have been outrageous for a person to do at that mm -hmm. time, or what wouldn't have been outrageous for a person to do at the time, and playing within those limits. So that's where most of my research went. Well, yeah, so by contrast, I was working from you know, a mountain of biographical material about Zelda, about Scott, about Scott and Zelda together. Um, we have a lot of writings about them, we have the writings that they each did themselves, and so the challenge for me was less to invent than to, to first of all, get to the bottom of mm -hmm. things, right, because we have sort of the popular notion, and then we have the biographer's opinion, and then we have the actual original source materials in some cases. Right. So, you know, I came to the project without a, a predisposition towards Zelda or towards Scott, except that I had this idea that she sort of deserved to be championed. But I still wanted to tell the truth, so finding the truth was really difficult. And I just had to sort of shut out the, the what I call Team Scott and Team Zelda and just try to tell the story in as authentic a way as the evidence presented itself to me. And were you both, I mean, I mean were you doing like exhaustive Google searches or were you like going to libraries? <laughs> Were you visiting sites, like historical sites? Like, I mean, the real texture of that research was it mostly, because it, it changes so much all the time, and I'm curious about that. I mean, for someone who's going to set out on writing a historical novel about a character, a person who lived, like, where where do you start? Books. I mean, just books. <laughs> books. For me, it was yeah. books. Piles. Yeah. Piles and piles of books. Yeah. And then, a, lot, a lot of reading. I, mean, I know you read, you know, research based things, but did you read literature of the period? I yes. And that was really helpful. Yes, I mean, I put myself on an absolute diet of, of, of literature of the 19th century literature. Yeah. Um, Which helps give you those textures. Right. You're talking about. Yeah, very strict diet of 19th century literature to get that book out really yeah. um, And then, sort of as a, an extension of that, I, we talked about this a little bit in an email where I mentioned this story. I had a teacher in grad school who talked about writing, talked about this famous thing that happened to E.L. Doctorow where a reader wrote him a letter about, I think it was. I forgot what book it was, but the reader was complaining that in Yale Doctor was a depiction of Arizona. There were no, he was wrong because there weren't any cacti there like the ones that the reader knew because the reader lived in Arizona and they knew it. Yale Doctor was wrong, his factual research was wrong, he made a mistake. And Yale Doctor wrote back, well, madam, in my Arizona there are. <laughs> <laughs> and so I guess I'm, I'm, that was free information from grad school and I wonder, there's a point right at which the research stopped being it sort of stopped being a thing. Um, and what was it like to kind of realize, like, I've done enough, now I need to start making stuff up? Um, and what did that look like, and how did you navigate the distance between making too much up and being away from your source material? I think, I think eventually you always have to go in. You know, you've, you've looked out for such a long time. 
and the vocabulary forms in your mind. Well, I'll talk to myself. A vocabulary forms in my mind. Mm -hmm. And it was at that point when I knew that there was no more looking out. I was looking in all the time to find that voice. And that's what was speaking. The vocabulary that I researched was what was activated when I thought, you know, what would we do this moment? There's a vocabulary there, and that's what that word was coming. And, that's, and I was only loyal to that. I didn't feel loyal to Marx and Engels, although I, I, I feel I would, uh, you know, I, I wasn't out for them, but I wasn't out to worship them either. Like but my loyalty was, was with Lizzie. I focused on Lizzie. Yeah, I think it's, it's a little bit freeing once you have whatever the facts are, are established, it gives you this framework in which you need to operate. And, and this isn't true for everyone who writes historical biographical fiction. There are authors who take liberties mm -hmm. with the facts, but I, I felt like because I was writing about people whose lives were so well documented that, that it would be a disservice to take liberties. You know, um, there wasn't as much space to to make up the story. But what we have, I think, in even in a, in a life that's so well documented as as Zelda's, as mm -hmm. Scott's was, are incidents, right? And then there comes the context for the incident that, that I had to invent in most cases. And so um, I wrote probably 150 novels. 150 novels. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Well, it felt like that. 150 pages of, of an initial draft in third person. And I feel like I was sort of teaching myself the story. Um, and, and my process is that I have to sort of write the story in order to find the story. And then once I was that far in, Yeah. And then I could go back to the beginning and let her tell the story. And I, I mean, I don't want to sound like one of those sort of crazy writers who goes, oh, my characters took over the story and told me what to say, because that was not at all. I wish that had happened. It would be so much easier. <laughs> um, but in fact, there is a kind of, I don't know, organic process. Once you yeah. know what you're doing, um, the story emerges from that. Well, it's sort of hard to talk about, right? Like, I noticed in both of these books, there's there are such specific moments, like Zelda tastes blackberries in her wine, and Lizzie notices the textures of the lace in the house in which she lives, and they notice it in these ways that are could only be, they feel so authentically them, but are completely <laughs> made up by you guys. Not, there's nowhere you could have found that out, and it's like an impossible question to ask, like, well, how did you know that, but how did you? In that case, you know, well, I that. Just, just like, um, yeah, I, no. I imagine it. Yeah, and I, it, just like the process of that character becoming more and more alive, it's just really fascinating to, to watch it unfold in the books. Um, and sort of as an extension of that, I'm curious about these voices too, and I love the Teresa you read in a southern accent because it's tempted. <laughs> um, and obviously, like Lily's Irishness is so there in her voice. Um, did you guys, how did you guys do that? Like, did you read out loud? Did you, was that also an innate kind of musical choice that comes from you as a writer? Did you practice? Did you exercise? I don't know. No, I didn't read out loud. So when I do read out loud now, now that I, I'm doing events, when it's finished, it's very, very strange to listen to myself. <laughs> it's not easy that I hear when I speak. <coughs> and so it's kind of an altered feeling like when I speak with my voice, it's not the voice I hear when I read in silence. I didn't read that. I did yeah. not read my book out loud when I was writing. No. Not, not at all. No. Wow. That's no. so surprising. I thought for no. sure you were gonna say, no. look, yeah, I read the whole no, book. No, for, for the reason that I, you know, I can hear my voice when I speak. Yeah. I'm a man. I'm, I'm writing by a woman. Yeah. And I found it challenging because I'm not a southerner. Mm -hmm. Although I've lived in the south for 20 years, and so I, I hear the, the southern drawl around me all the time, but I'll tell you, this is quite funny, I had a draft of the book done uh, at about the time that um, the Woody Allen Midnight in Paris movie came out, and Alison Hill, you know, was, was doing a version of Zelda, <laughs> and so I watched it a few times, and then I tried to imitate Alison Hill's version of Zelda when I read the draft out loud, and it, 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 was, it was useful for me to kind of Fortunately, I'm female, and I was female, so I wasn't <coughs> quite as far off the mark as, as what you were saying. Um, but it, it did sort of help me take things out, put things in, emphasize, de-emphasize. Mm -hmm. um, so Alison Pill's um, dialect coach has 
<laughs> to get the credit for this. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, and just to, to get even like more specific about this, these voices, because they are really perfect for both of these books, or these, the textures of these voices. I mean, Gavin, Lizzie could read. So, and yet her language is so poetic, actually. And I wonder if that was ever a consideration for you. Like, did you ever worry as a writer, like, am I going to cheat? Like, is she yeah, too so eloquent? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, once the research was done and I was writing, then all the work was on Lizzie's voice mm -hmm. and sustaining Lizzie's voice. Mm -hmm. And I made the decision very, very early on <coughs> that Lizzie's illiteracy shouldn't impoverish her voice, and that it should yeah. enri enrich it, yeah. and that, you know, to have a, a certain lyricism. And obviously there's, it's, there's lots of poetic license in there, obviously. Um, <coughs> but, and, you know, my, my aim was that she would have a very strong voice, and that if she could be called feminist or radical, or, you know, if her, you know, it was by the force of her voice mm -hmm. rather than what she was saying. What she says is often conservative, it's often reactionary, it's often racist. But what, by the force of her voice, somehow should be, be seen as, as, yeah. as a strong kind. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm really impressed with the ability to sort of invent her from whole cloth. You know, I, I feel like it was kind of a cheat. At least had Zelda's own writing. Yeah. You know, her letters from when she was young and then the short stories mm -hmm. that she wrote, mm -hmm. which actually formed the style in which I yeah. had her tell the story. I, um, in your case, I wondered, uh, Zelda, your your portrayal of her, she's such a spitfire. Like, she's so, and I wondered if that was ever, like, a question that you asked yourself as a writer. Like, if, at what moment will Zelda be serious? <laughs> and at what moment will she be, yeah, like, no, let loose with some flash? It, it was a, a really important consideration because, you know, again, the public perception of Zelda is what I call zany Zelda. Zelda yeah. we got him in, in Paris is, is sort of who we think she was. But she was that woman when she was very young, and she was that woman sometimes, but she wasn't always that right. woman. And so, you know, I, I needed to give her uh, an introspective voice at the beginning, because it's 1940, and then to take us back to her as, a, as an 18-year-old, and she's got me, you know, have a, a little more energy in the early times than, yeah. To represent her journey as she struggled with her marriage and her mental illness, and then you know, eventually the reconciliation that almost happened. Right, right. Yeah. right. Lizzie has a little bit of that spit fiery. <laughs> a lot of it, actually. It's another thing these books have in common. I think this sort of like fiery, like I won't do what you expect me to do, yeah. essence to the characters. It was fun to read, think about them in conjunction like this. Um, yes, but I'd like to say something about Lizzie yeah. in that sense. You know, she starts off and then with a manifesto that seems quite hard, mm -hmm. you know, about men. But actually, I think she's a very soft woman mm -hmm. that, you know, once you scratch away at that hardness, which she has learned as a kind of survival technique, she's actually very vulnerable and secure. And that all, that, all that spit firing is hiding something quite soft. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I think, you know, when it starts the book and, and she, she seems to be craving luxury, she seems to be craving the good life that's mm -hmm, about to mm -hmm. occur, about to happen. She says, you know, my dreams have come true. I think really, and she learns, you know, what happens when you get what you want, which is your book as well, obviously. Yeah. <coughs> and I think what Lizzie learns by the end, that really a carpet is a carpet. A crystal glass is a crystal glass. You know, it's, it's the way it's thick or thin, you still have to drink out of it, you know. But, what she really craved all along was rest. Yeah. Rest. Yeah. I love that. It's like, really moving. Um, I also had a question that kind of goes along these lines. You guys may not be interested in answering it, but in there are case, some. We'll leave. Yeah, just <laughs> feel free. Uh, there's some really, in both books, noticeable um, attention is paid to the details of the body, is how I phrase it. There are some really. <laughs> Uh, vivid and memorable sex scenes in singles for anyone who's on the fence about buying it. <laughs> and, um, and Zelda's conscious of her body in a way that I found really moving actually, like her thinness and the kinds of clothes she can wear and how it's an asset and how it makes her vulnerable. And also, Lizzie has an encounter with an STD early in the book, which is 
alarming in, in its um, realisticness or something. She gets the clock. Yes. Um, Mars has oils. I mean, these are books that, I mean, in, when we're thinking about historical novels in which there are things about human, like, these people lives that we can't know, you guys went for it in a lot of different ways, but you also went for these things about the body that are very, like, lived in details. And I wonder how much of that was just, like, this is how you imagine something fully, or how much of it was conscious. Well, you know, it's important, isn't it? Because don't we all sort of move through the world, um, through the experience of, our physical selves, when we're cold or we feel well or we don't feel well. Um, I think we have, we owe it to our characters, you know, especially in Zelda's case, she suffered from, from you know, abdominal pain and, and disorders that, that affected very much how she behaved, you know, how much she socialized when she didn't. You know, that's a very little known part yeah. of her story, but it is, it's important to say, to show, you know, that these are actual people. And, and even if we had invented the, the characters entirely, I think the fiction makes them real in those ways. Yeah. It's our job. Yeah. Did you have Yeah, and Lizzie is surrounded by theorists, <laughs> theorists, writers, you know, cerebral people. And yeah, I wanted to explore what the body meant in, in you know, the material. I mean, Marx <laughs> talks about the material, yeah. but it's all about it changing the world in a material way, but he's talking about it in his theories. So I wanted the material to be really, really important to the book. And Lizzie's body is the closest material that I was working with. So yeah. that's really fun to have a woman's body for a while. I <laughs> say, so, you know, the, the representation of her, of her sister's experience is also yeah. really visceral and powerful. And Especially since you've never been a woman that we did. <laughs> sex scene, you know, is one of those one of those moments where I really had to try and stay with Lizzie. So I'd done all this research and the 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 temptation is to activate it all. You, yeah. know, you enter a scene and it's all this research. You want to get it all in. The mo like the sex scene is the moment where if at any moment you feel that Lizzie's receding and I'm going into angles, mm -hmm. that's really the moment you know it's like push angles back. Yeah. And, is sexy, is Lizzie sexy, and you stay with her. So it was important for me in that sense. The first sex, the sex scene was quite early in the book, the first one. And that was a kind of, kind of almost like a showing the reader mm -hmm. that this is going to be about Lizzie. This is Lizzie's mm -hmm. experience. This, isn't, yeah. this is Lizzie's orgasm. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's interesting for both books also. Like, were you afraid? Like, there's these sort of things they're supporting characters in. In both of your books are like people that I would be terrified to write about ever, like Alice in the books and yeah. Marx and Engels. And I mean, what did you did you have any anxiety as writers coming to like portraying Ernest Hemingway as a supporting character? Or there is a danger. I mean, if you write about real people at all, in there will be some rabid person out there who believes that you got it wrong, yeah. that you you disrespected them in some way. Of course, I've heard a little bit about Hemingway's depiction. Or he can take it. I think, <laughs> <laughs> it <deserves> it. <laughs> I, I think you have to put that all out of your head at some point and tell the story. And then, you know, just don't read the reviews. <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of my reviews, which you might remember, I don't know, I think it's from the UK edition actually, it said, um, no, it's Kirkus, I think, it was from, from here. Mm. And said, you know, who thought that reading about communists could be so much fun? That was Curtis. <laughs> and I got tweet, I got trolled on Twitter with articles about the horrors of communism in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> How can you speak about communism being fun? Yeah. This is the reality of communism. <laughs> 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 read the book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think I'll, I want to open it up to you guys because we probably have maybe 10 minutes for questions and I want to give you guys a chance to ask your burning questions. Um, yes? I have a question for, Ga excuse me, for Gavin. Um, when I was hearing you read the uh, opening passages, I thought the prose was really great. The prose was beautiful. Thank you. So here's this voice, and it's not your voice. We've heard you talk a lot tonight. You, you don't have the same voice. How conscious were you while you were writing of it being, there's no Lizzie, right? It's just words on a yeah. page. How conscious were you of the quality of the prose you were trying to achieve? 
uh, vary. <laughs> of what did the pros vary? Of what the voice was, very little. Like, I knew it was, I knew I was creating an illusion. I was aware that I was doing, I was constructing an illusion. What was going into that, I was less aware of. You know, you know, its exact source, or you know, but I was very aware of. But I wanted it to be a particular, a very, very strong thing. So you're very conscious of the, of words on the page, that you, and then you would change something to. Oh yes, yeah. a lot of good work. Mm -hmm. I work like this, you know, mm -hmm. always probably going back and going through, going back and going through, going back and going through. I really move on until I'm really happy with what's gone before. I'm not a. I'll get one draft done, find it out. I'm, I'm much slower. Than Um, Gavin, I wondered about your um, how you got to know Lizzie Burns historically. <clears throat> were there any photos of her? Did Angles write about her? Were other people writing actual letters about her? <clears throat> so there's one photo where she's turned to the side of the profile and she has jet black hair and she's kind of stop, like sturdy looking. Um, and she's mentioned in the Mark Engels correspondence in passing. So something like, my regards to Lizzie, how is Lizzie? Lizzie's, Lizzie was on the drink last night, things like that, but nothing, <laughs> nothing substantial. It's like a ghost that walks in and out of these drawing rooms. That, you know, Marks and Engels had a very, very, they corresponded a lot because for most of their lives, well, 20 important years of their lives, Marx was in London, Engels was in Manchester. So there's this very high, there's a high volume of letters between the two men. Um, and the absence of Liz, both Lizzie and her sister, who, who Engels also had a relationship mm -hmm. with. Engels had a relationship with Lizzie's sister first, and when Mary, Lizzie's sister, died, he then had a relationship with Lizzie. Um, and so the absence of these two women in these letters is, is very popular. is for to raise. Um, now that Z is being televised, how does it feel for you as a writer, having invested so much of yourself into, you're saying, you know, drawing all the information from different sources, so now there's another production company that are running with it, so is that hard for you as a writer to kind of let go? Do you feel that they're representing Z in the way that you wanted them to? Um, yeah, so far. Yeah, I had, I had the pleasure of, of going to visit the set while they filming part of the, what would be the pilot episode for the series. <coughs> and you know, I'll say, initially, I was sort of, first of all, quite surprised that, that anyone would initially option the material because I didn't invent the Fitzgeralds, you know, they're, they're not my characters. The, the story exists just in the way that I gathered it and, and interpreted it. But what I, what I found out later was that um, Christina Ricci, had read the novel when it was first published, and she <coughs> contacted her manager because she wanted to audition for the role of Zelda. She, she, she assumed that someone had already acquired the rights and that there would be a film that she wanted to star in the film. And when she discovered that, that the rights were available, she changed her approach. She decided that this was something she wanted to specifically involve herself in. And so you know, it took about a year, actually, for this to all evolve. But I was, I was flattered, but I also did not feel any real ownership of whatever the product would be. And I think that that's what writers have to do. You know, you, you sign the line, they send you a check, and you just have to let it go. When we went to the set to see them filming, um, I had this sort of, you know, the experience of I don't have anything to do with any of this. I'm just really excited to get to visit. Until we watched them do a scene in which the dialogue had come from the book. It was, it was a scene that I had invented entirely that they were adapting for the show, and then it all sort of clicked into place for me. And I understood that, that it, it's more than just that these people exist. There was a, I, I'm telling a version of their story. The people who are making the show <coughs> tell that version of the story. And so, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm doing a fantastic job now. 
ask me five episodes in if I like what they're doing, but, but so far so good. I'm really pleased and um, I feel very fortunate. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I, had a, I had a question for both of you actually. Um, well, first of all, I think this is your debut novel for both of you, isn't it? Actually, like, um, my, first, my first historical novel. Okay. Ooh. Yeah. All right. Um, but it is Gavin's yeah. first. But it's your first. Okay. And I was just curious. Um, moving on to the novel that follows, are you? Do you change things? Um, I mean, it's so ambitious to do all this research. Um, do you think that you will, you know, go away from that entirely and be completely fiction? And and I can ask you as well, Therese, um, because you get so involved with this one character. Um, I'm just curious, how, how do you follow it? Yeah, I want to know what you're writing next. Yeah. Well, it is completely fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Karl Marx is fiction. It's <laughs> all <laughs> fiction. Um, the next book, yes, lots of research. I'm in the middle of it right now. Um, I feel I've opened kind of a Pandora's box, and I've raised lots of issues in my mind that I've want to continue to address, so, yeah, and the next one's lots of research as well. Yeah. I think I'll be like that. It's 20th century. Next one. Um, I, I will reveal a little bit more. Um, I've decided that, that there's something sort of incredibly satisfying to anyone who's sort of a nerd for history to immerse yourself into a period of time, and um, what I discovered was that, that I can satisfy a lot of different desires in the process of you know, learning about history. Uh, I'll be writing a novel about, I am writing a novel about the Vanderbilts, um, that's my next project. And for example, I was, I was looking through Z, just sort of paging through before we came tonight, and I realized, you know, Zelda and Scott, um, for their, their wedding night, they stay at the Biltmore Hotel. Mm -hmm. It didn't mean anything to me when I was writing Z, but now, of course, I, oh my gosh, that's named for, for the Vanderbilt family, and there's this statue of, of the Commodore outside of, of Grand Central Station. Well, you know, he built the original Grand Central Depot. It, it gives you, it, it makes things relevant that weren't relevant before. And so I would say that, that just making up a story is sort of boring <laughs> in comparison to writing about real places and real people and real, and real eras. It's much more satisfying. <coughs> I don't know if it's better for readers. Some people only read historical fiction, some people never read it. But I think that there is a richness um, that informs me as a person that I get from, from doing it that way. So I'm going to keep doing it that way. <laughs> I think we have time for just one more. Follow up on that. Um, I, um, I heard a speech by a, 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 a pretty well known writer uh, who said that he, he objected very much to the idea of anyone writing stories about historical figures uh, on the idea that it's, it's incredibly presumptuous mm. to, to hold the case. Presumptuous. Well, <laughs> old fiction is historical. Old fiction is presumptuous and old fiction is historical. My, my novel is no more or no less historical than any other novel that's ever written. If I wrote a novel about this evening, it would be a historical novel. Mm -hmm. I was there is sort of a question like, do we, do we, well, I, I, no, <laughs> no, I'm saying I do. I do think it's presumptuous. Yeah. No more than any other. <coughs> My mother is in this book. Everywhere. Although she didn't recognize herself. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's everywhere. That's enormously presumptuous. She's my mother. How dare I? <laughs> it's almost worth the losing mark. No? <laughs> presupposes that you should only use facts and not make up any story about these people. But I, I will say, even scholarship, you know, even these biographies that I use for my research are interpretations of information. You know, only those people know what's true. I probably don't know this. <laughs> um, I think that's just about all the
the time we have, but thank you to the Center for Fiction and know that books are for sale and Therese and Gabriel stick around to sign them and continue the conversation. Um, thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you.